The breezy call of incense breathing morn, the swallow twittering from the straw-built shed, the cock's shrill clarion or the echoing horn, no more shall rouse them from their lowly bed. For them no more the blazing hearth shall burn, or busy housewife ply her evening care. No children run to lisp their sire's return, or climb his knees the envied kiss to share. Oft did the harvest to their sickle yield, their furrow oft the stubborn glebe has broke. How jocund did they drive their team afield, how bowed the woods beneath their sturdy stroke. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and destiny obscure, nor grandeur hear with a disdainful smile the short and simple annals of the poor. Well, the annals of the poor might have been short and simple. Their destinies were certainly obscure, but sometimes there was plenty of life and colour about them. Look at these names. The Topples, Denny, Frost, Jesse Tiderman, the sexton and parish clerk, and the Edwards. They lie peacefully enough in this quiet spot now, but once these bones were stirred to a great passion. This, by the way, is Little Stonham Church between Ipswich and Norwich. You'd have thought, wouldn't you, that the voice that breathed all this little Eden would have been filled with harmony. But no. Once upon a time, there was a voice that breathed o'er Little Stonham that was heard throughout the length and breadth of East Anglia. Church and nation in England have always had great clashes. But once Little Stonham had a revolution all of its own. And I'd like to tell you this story. It was about a hundred years ago and the people involved were so vivid that as soon as you start to talk about them, it's as though you could see them walking through the lanes of the village again or coming in the churchyard gate. The trouble all began, really, with the coming of the new curate, the Reverend William Barley. One day in 1870, he came from Framlingham and with him, his quiet wife and their small baby. He settled in very quietly. Some even thought ominously. He walked about, taking everything in, but not saying much. He walked past the villagers, they walked past him. They spoke to each other. But in the upshot, not much was really said. Good morning. What a beautiful morning it is. Yes, sir. That's a lovely morning. Lovely morning. Good day to you, sir. Still waters, as they say, run deep. And rumours began to grow that Mr. Barley had left Framlingham because of some trouble with his parishioners. Certainly, he liked his own way, and he was, well, truculent. He didn't make up his own mind until somebody else had made up theirs, and then he would decide just the opposite. He was an awkward customer, and there were those in the village who began to think that he was much more interested in the church itself than in its members. Feelings began to get about. Eyes began to flash and flicker and look down. Lips began to mutter. Gossip began to do its work. And all this mounting up of feeling focused on one particular issue. Should the church services be read or sung? If you'd have been alive in Little Stonham in 1872, you'd have thought that all the rights of man hung in the balance on this one question. Mr. Barley knew one thing for certain and he let everybody in the village know about this. He, and only he, had the authority to decide. But he couldn't make his mind up. And it's here that I have to introduce you to the other awkward character in the plot, Harvey. Come all you single fellows, won't you 
like to hear a song If you listen to my ditty, I won't get my Edgar Harvey, a young, rumbustious labourer, known and liked by everybody in the village, full of life, full of himself, and, in particular, full of his own voice. And that in we will go Where the blue cockade all in her hat She made a pretty show Oh, and that we will go, my boy Come on Come on, boy up, up. Come on Come, 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 come. Harvey loved everything musical, and he had quite a following in the village. Nobody knew how official it was, but it was generally assumed that he was the choir master. And when his voice rang out over the pews in Little Stonham Church, the congregation warmed to his enthusiasm. Everybody except the Reverend William Barley, Mrs. Barley, and the new young lady who played the organ, Miss Smith. She and Miss Smith were the musicians, and she and Miss Smith would decide about the music and the form of singing. She gradually insisted on ousting Harvey's choir from the singing gallery and having there instead a small company of children. In that sweet sound, whether at rehearsal or in performance, Harvey and his voice had no place at all. He was edged out into an open-eyed, open-mouthed frustration. It was the same with Miss Smith. She too resented Harvey's presence in her organ loft. And besides that, he never took care to keep his distance. Hello? Hello up there. Mr. Harvey, we have had about enough of this. It never ends. You never can see when you are intruding on people, imposing yourself, Mr. Harvey. I begin to think that you are up to no good. I... Miss Smith, what... Can't stand it, Mr. Barley. He keeps on interfering. He never stops. He, he won't lean on me. He keeps turning over the pages too soon. He will keep telling me what I ought to play. Who is the organist in this church, I should like to know? I should like to know who knows about music in this church. It's impossible. It, it's objectionable. I can't stand all this arguing, all this interfering. Oh. Be calm. Be calm, Miss Smith. Calm yourself. We have had just about enough of this, Mr. Harvey. Leave this gallery, if you please. There will be no more music practice here until you can learn to behave yourself in something approaching the manner of a Christian gentleman. Oh, Mr. Barley, oh. Ain't I got any say in the choir's music then? Don't I have any say as choir master? These new people, they come here and they think they can tell everybody that where... Mr. Harvey, is enough. Now compose yourself, Miss Smith. There will be no more of this, I do assure you. Now come along. But if the Reverend Barley wasn't certain about whether the services should be read or sung, Edgar Harvey was. Come hell or high water, come the end of the world, let alone a new poking, interfering parson from Framlingham, he, Harvey, was going to sing. One pleasant day in 1872, in all the mounting bitterness of feelings, in all the vacillating gossip of indecision, a juncture came. Mr. Barley took his wife away for a long holiday. This was one event which none of his parishioners minded. There were even smiles and waves when the wheels of their gig sent up their farewell dust along the road of the village. While the cat was away, the mice decided to play. For six whole weeks, they sang their heads off, hymns and chants alike, it was glorious. All the time, the services were sung. All the time, the services were enjoyed. And Harvey came into his own. His voice roared out in full liberty. When, some six weeks later, Mr. Barley rode back into the village one Sunday, 
He heard what to others was a glad sound, but what to him was an affront, a challenge. And at once, this decided him. His mind was now made up, irrevocably. Harvey was not going to have his own way. From now on, services should not be sung, but read. Music was silenced at Little Stonham. The hand of ecclesiastical authority had clamped down. Nerves and relationships were all at a high pitch of tension, at fever pitch. And some plotting was going on. Somebody had interfered with the lock of the door leading to the singing gallery. At any rate, on October the 6th, 1872, the crisis of this situation had arrived. The afternoon service began and, as it turned out, developed very strangely. Here ended the first lesson. We will now stand and say the Magnificat. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath grown my soul in thanksgiving. It's Mr. Edward's job, that is. I don't know. Constable Cook, I command you, take those men out of this place of worship. Take them into custody. I... Come with me. Restrain yourself, Willie. Don't get so excited. Continue, Constable Cook. There is no church warden. I recognize no church warden here. I tell you, I insist not Mr. Edwards, not anyone else. I tell you, the responsibility is mine alone. Be a good man. Do as I authorize you. Remove those men this instant. They're breaking the law. I will not have my services wrecked in this manner. He had to the hungry with good food. Sing it, Ed. Reverend Barney says you've got to stop. I will take him to court. I will. Such disgrace, such behaviour! We shall see who is in authority here! I... I... Go! From the church to the magistrate's court at Needham Market, Mr. Barley meant every word he said. Harvey was charged with having caused a public disturbance. I'd give a lot to be able to see that courtroom scene as it was then.
This is part of the court record. There was a bench of four magistrates, two clergymen, an army major, and one other. It was one of the clergymen who was chairman, and he was obviously as nervous as a kitten, frightened to death of any legalistic objections that might arise. Some of the villagers were there too. P.C. Cook, John Topple, and some others gave evidence to round out the story as Mr. Barley himself did. But when the fact arose that Barley had come from Framlingham, the lawyer who was acting for Harvey, a Mr. Watts, jumped in on this fact right away. Was it not because you made yourself so disagreeable that the bishop ordered you to leave Framlingham? Positively not. Was there not, shall we say, some unpleasantness? No, there certainly was not. Well, turning to October the 6th, it surprises me that you ordered Cook, PC, to remove Harvey from the gallery. Are you not aware that Mr. Edwards has received instructions from the rector to act as church warden? Mr. Edwards has made no intimation of that to me. I repudiate him entirely. I have been informed by the Bishop of Norwich that the appointment is in my hands. I see. I see. Well, to come now to Harvey, is there not some ill feeling on your part towards this young man? No. None at all. Was not Harvey in the habit of leading the parish choir? He was not. Is he not, in fact, the choir master? He decidedly is not. Well, was he not considered the choir master? No, sir. He is simply a troublesome fellow. But it could be true, could it not, to say the defendant has taken a very active part in the choir? My answer to that is that he sang very loudly. You say you have had complaints about all this. Who made these complaints? Well, Mr. Bloomfield, the late church warden, made complaints all the time. And uh, Miss Smith, the new young person who plays the organ, was continually making complaints. He was always uh, interfering with her, always wanting his way with her. That we all do, Mr. Barber. <laughs> Gentlemen, it has been the custom from time immemorial in Little Stonham, as in other churches, to chant those glorious chants to be found in the Church of England prayer book. And the parishioners feel so strongly they would have attended this court in a body to swear that there was no attempt on the part of the defendant, Harvey, to cause a disturbance. I believe a few witnesses will be all that is needed to show that it was not the defendant who disturbed the congregation, but that there is ill feeling and maliciousness against him on the part of Mr. Barley. Now you are Mrs. Laura Therese Edwards, wife of Mr. John Edwards, a farmer who believes himself to be a church warden. Will you say in your own words what happened in church that afternoon? Well, after the first lesson was read, the Magnificat was chanted by some young men in the gallery. Do you know these young men? There were several there, but I saw Harvey among them. Was it sung in an orderly manner? Yes, sir, as I've always been accustomed to hear it sung. Did you hear Harvey sing louder than the others? Not at all, but it is usual for Harvey to take the lead in the singing. When Mr. Barley called out to the singers to stop, did he call out in an improper manner? He called out loud. Very excitable. Did you hear what he said? Yes. He said, turn those people out of the church. Did Constable Cook do so? No. He said he had no power inside the church. You were quite at the mercy of Mr. Barley, whether you had this service of praise or not. Uh, quite so. Isn't it true that in my time I have paused to allow you to get to your pew? I don't think so. I yeah, have is it... it not a fact that you were seen to leave church with a triumphant smile upon your lips? Are you aware why Mr. Barley called out to them to stop? Some time ago. He said there would be no singing if Harvey was up in the gallery. He said that in church, out loud. He said... Singing in the gallery 
could not be conducted to the glory of God if that person was out in the gallery. That is the only weak point I ever made in my life. You are Mrs. Elizabeth Dawling, and you are a regular attender at the church. When Mr. Barley cried out, did you join in the singing? Oh, sir, I was too frightened. Frightened? What frightened you? Mr. Barley's manner. He shouted out to P.C. Cook, I command you to take those men here into custody. Is Harvey a sober man? He's a perfectly sober man. Mr. Barley has told me he does not care how many come to church. He'd as soon preach to the walls as to the people. Did I not say rather that I should prefer a few sincere persons in a pew to a whole mass of people going for a spree? You said you only did. Did you get a church to have a comfortable home for your wife and family? But after all this, with the court seething all about them, the bench decided not to decide, not to convict. The case, they felt, deserved a higher court. By which they meant Ipswich Quarter Sessions and a judge and a jury. The case came up early in January, 1873. The evidence was much the same, but the tension had thickened and built up over another three months. And this time, the entire village did turn out and for a trial that lasted for six uproarious hours. When the time came for the summing up, there was a high pitch of expectation, and each advocate made the most of his piece. First came the speech for the defense. Gentlemen of the jury, I will be brief. It is a sad spectacle when a clergyman comes to court to banter words of evidence with his parishioners and to resist their wishes. You've heard the evidence of almost the entire village, both young and old, rich and poor. And I know that you can judge whether you think that Mr. Barley represents in his person that spirit of Christian charity without which no man should remain in a parish as a clergyman be that parish, large or small. I contend, and I think you have heard enough to convince you, that it was Mr. Barley, by his own excited manner, who caused the disturbance. There is no doubt, alas, there is a dreariness of services being imposed upon the congregation of Little Stonham where there is nothing more tuneful than Mr. Barley's tuneful voice. What is particularly clear is that the village, to a man, and almost to a woman, would rather hear Harvey sing a hymn once than Mr. Barley preach for a month. Gentlemen of the jury, I will be even more brief. When some loud-mouthed ignorant labourer who fancies he has a knowledge of music and a good voice chooses to force himself on the congregation until the clergyman is compelled to take steps of this kind, and when an able counsel is employed to throw dirt at that clergyman so as to gain the applause of those in court who are filled with Ipswich beer or something else to cause excitement, the jury will understand the animus of the defense. There is nothing like roasting a parson for amusing the ignorant. Mr. Barley has had one desire only and wants only to have the correctness of that desire upheld to maintain his authority in his own parish church. Well, then there was only the final question, on which everything, all the long months of disputation, now hung. Gentlemen of the jury, do you find the prisoner guilty or not guilty? Not guilty.
And that, apart from one or two letters to the press, was where the story ended. Music and liberty seemed to have triumphed. But who was mostly in the right and who was mostly in the wrong, we shall never know. What we do know, however, is that within a few years, Mr. Barley had moved on to Intwood near Norwich and then went on to other livings in the Church of England. And there's one element of his story that I haven't mentioned so far. During his stay here in Little Stonham, he and his wife had a second daughter, Mabel Susan. She only lived 16 months and now lies here under this cross. Coming from Framlingham with rumour and going from Little Stonham with much more than rumour, Mr Barley must have left a good deal of sorrow behind. But Harvey and his voice went on and there are still some people in Little Stonham who remember him, who were children in the village school here when Harvey was an old man just before the First World War. And how do they remember him? Some remember him as Old Edgar, and others as Spring-heeled Jack, because of his splay-footed gait. He was scrog-footed, they say. They remember him as an old tramp-like figure with a tall hat walking along the roadside, a labourer who had it up here, and who was very often out of work but always neatly dressed. And they remember him especially at Christmas time, going from door to door among the cottagers in the village, all alone and singing carols. And they're all agreed on this one thing, with an awful voice. And we know too that during the 1930s, some Suffolk folk songs were taken down here from a man who almost certainly knew Edgar Harvey. The voice that breathed, or little Stonham, that once seemed to bring fire and brimstone in its train, did in fact, it seems, do a good deal to keep music alive. And that is a lot. English country churchyards really are elegies, are they not? Green, sleepy, beautiful. But it wasn't always so. In God's little acres, our forefathers once saw Stirring times. Mm -hmm. 